Welcome to NWO Voices Dryden. I'm Jack Dawson. The following video is taken from the July 10th Dryden City Council. The meeting covers a proposed zoning amendment where councillors proposed a shift from residential type 1 to multi-residential with a minor variance for lot shape accommodation. The meeting also covered a long overdue update to property assessment. Stephen Darico from the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation explained how COVID-19's impact delayed the reassessment. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this meeting is convened pursuant to the provisions of Section 34 of the Planning Act, 1990, Part 13, as amended. The purpose of this meeting is to give the public an opportunity to make representation in respect to, of a proposed amendment to the City of Dryden's comprehensive zoning bylaw. I'll ask that when members aren't speaking that they turn the microphones off so we don't experience feedback. I'd like to call for declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature of their of under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act with respect to the agenda for this meeting. Hearing and seeing none, I'd uh, like to acknowledge with respect that we're in the Treaty 3 territory and that the land on which we are gathered is the traditional territory, the Anishinaabe and the Métis people. The applicant is 2420384 Ontario Inc. Land is located at 107 and 109 Edgewater Drive, Dryden. Land owner is the same, 2420384 Ontario Inc. And the purpose and effect of the proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaws to rezone the subject land from residential type one to multi residential in order to permit a four unit building on the currently vacant lots. Additionally, due to the shape of the lots, the application includes a minor variance to allow an exception to the rear yard requirement to 5.2 meters from the multi-residential zoning requirement of a minimum of 7.5 meters setback from the rear lot line of the subject land. Now I'll ask the clerk to provide information on notice of passing of bylaws regarding this amendment. Thank you. Anyone wishing further notice with respect to the passage of the proposed bylaw is to make a written request to my attention. I must provide notice of council's decision to all of those who request that information within 15 days after the day the bylaw has been passed. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Council of the Corporation of the City of Dryden before a bylaw is passed, that person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Ontario Land Tribunal, unless in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. One of the purposes of the Planning Act is to provide for planning processes that are open, accessible, timely, and efficient. Accordingly, all written submissions, documents, correspondences, emails, or other communications, including your name and address, form a part of the public record and will be disclosed or made available by the city to anyone the city deems appropriate. And in providing such information, members of the public shall be deemed to have consented to its use and disclosure as part of the planning process. Anyone entitled may appeal Council's decision to the Ontario Land Tribunal by filing with myself within 20 days of the notice of decision. Notice of appeal must set out the objection of this to the decision and the reasons in support of the objection accompanied by the required fee. Thank you. And I'll now ask the clerk to provide information or notices regarding this public meeting. Okay, notice of this meeting was uh, given on June the 5th, 2023 by postings on the City of Dryden website and Facebook page and was also provided on the agendas of the June 12th Committee of the Whole and June 26th Council meetings. Additionally, letters and the public notice were provided to all property owners within 120 metres of the subject properties. Thank you, and I'll ask you to explain the procedures of this meeting. Thank okay. You. Procedures are as follows. The city's junior planner, Mr. Mehta, will present a report on the amendment application, uh, followed by a presentation of any correspondence received regarding the application, any comments from the applicant, and then by members of the public who'd like to provide comments in support of or opposition of the, to the application. Uh, members of the public in attendance, of which there are none, uh, would, who would like to speak would be asked to uh, speak after that. And anyone making an oral presentation is asked to identify themselves prior to making their presentations, to introduce new and critical material only so that there isn't a repetition of points raised by previous speakers, 
and also to address all questions and comments to the chair. Thank you. I'll now invite Mr. Mehta, the city's junior planner, to present his staff report, please. Thank you, everyone, and good evening. So a little bit of background and proposal. Um, a zoning bylaw amendment or application was submitted uh, for the subject lands municipally known as 107 and 109 Edgewater Drive in the city of Dryden. Uh, the subject lands are shown in the figure one uh, of the report which has been shared. The subject lands are proposed to be rezoned from the residential type one or R1 zone to the multi-residential or RM1 zone in order to permit a four unit fourplex building. The property fronts onto the Edgewater Drive, which is a municipally maintained road. And in addition, due to the shape of the deemed lot, a ZBA includes an, a minor variance to allow an exception to the rear yard requirements to 5.2 meters from the R RM1 zoning requirement of a minimum 7.5 meter setback from the rear lot line of the subject land. The proposed development is a four unit fourplex building and the features accommodations with two bedroom accessible units. Uh, the main access to the subject lands will be provided from the Edgewater Drive. The building will be serviced with municipal and sanitary uh, water and sanitary services. The proposed site plan drawing is shown on figure two and the proposed elevation drawings of the proposed building are shown on figure three. The applicant had also submitted a deeming bylaw application 2022-59 to combine the property into one lot, which was approved in November 2022 and conditional on this ZBA approval. Discussion for provincial policy statement 2020 is a document that guides development in the province. In the context of the PPS, the subject lands are located within the settlement area. The settlement areas shall be the focus of growth and development and their vitality and regeneration shall be promoted. The new development proposed will generate additional housing units through this application. The City of Dryden official plan. The subjects are located within the stable areas designation of the official plan. Acceptable uses in stable areas designation include residential, commercial, industrial and institutional uses that presently exist in the city. The designation of the lands as stable areas indicates that there will be a little change in these areas over lifetime of this plan. Section 3.2.5, 4.1.3, 4.1.5 of the official plan encourages housing intensification and allows minor changes to the land use. The use of property as a fourplex building supports the objectives of the official plan. It is not expected that there will be any increases to traffic or noise resulting from the change in land use designation. Section 4.9.3 of the official plan mandates environmental impact assessment or EIA to be completed in accordance with the policy 5.8 of the official plan to address potential impacts on the wetlands. The subject property is in 120 meters of the wetland as identified on Schedule B. An EIA was completed in accordance with the policy 5.8 and no potential impacts were identified. The EIA report is also attached for the reference with the, uh, with the main report. The City of Dryden Zoning Bylaw. The permitted uses within the RM zone or the multi-residential zone are provided in section 4.3.1 of the Zoning Bylaw and it includes quadruplex or fourplex dwelling building. A review of the zone standards of the RM zone is included in table two. This review is based on details provided in the ZBA application and supporting documentation. The subject lands exceed the minimum lot area of the RM zone and the proposed building is compliant to parking and lot coverage standards of the zone. Based on the above mentioned facts, the building and planning department recommend that the zoning bylaw amendment be approved by the council if during this public meeting, no questions or adversarial com comments are received, council may elect to proceed directly to a decision at the next regular council meeting on July 24, 2023, or can elect uh, or can elect to request a recommendation report to be provided. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will now ask the clerk to identify any correspondence that was received with regard to this meeting and the proposed bylaw amendment. 
Other than the one comment that uh, Mr. Mehta received in favor of the development and is noted in the report, uh, a few weeks ago I took a call from a resident who would only say that he couldn't believe council would go through with this bylaw amendment. He did not expand on why he thought council should not vote in favor of it. Um, that was the only other comment that we have received on this. Okay. I'll now ask the clerk to run this portion of the meeting. Okay. Uh, there are no virtual attendees besides a couple of members of council. Uh, there are no uh, real live people in the room to uh, speak as uh, members of the public. So we'll just skip on over that. And so I guess we can go on to the next segment. All right. Um, so now I'll ask any members of council, if they have any remarks or questions concerning this application. And we're looking to provide direction on its disposition tonight. Any uh, comments or questions? Did I understand correctly? Sorry, through the chair. Did I understand correctly that in looking at the agenda here, it says we can refer this to an open meeting for disposition to be the next regular council meeting or today? 24th, that's what I thought I heard. Yeah, that's right. We'll bring it to our the next council meeting for approval. Okay, is, is everybody in favor of moving forward with this? Need some nod, Bill. Okay, um, I think we got through direction there. We're all in favor of bring, moving this to the next meeting for approval. Thank you. And I guess that brings us to adjournment. Just quick, I will now ask the clerk to ask two members of council to move and second the motion. As mentioned, I'd be looking for two members. I see Councillor Noel. Yep. And Councillor Latham, thank you. Moved by Councillor Noel, seconded by Councillor Latham that this meeting be declared adjourned. All those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Microphone's off so we don't experience any feedback. Would now like to call for declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act with respect to the agenda for this meeting. Oh, well, seeing none. I'd also like to call for declaration of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act for meetings at which a member was not in attendance and which had not previously been declared. Okay, hearing none. I'd like to begin by acknowledging with respect that we are in Treaty 3 territory and that the land on which we are gathered is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Métis people. Uh, we have no delegations tonight, but we do have one presentation this evening, and I'll invite Mr. DeRocco from MPAC to address the council um, over at the uh, podium there. Just have to switch on the mic whenever you'd like to speak. Thank you. Just trying to get this right here. Thank you, Your Worship. So my name is Stephen Duraco. I'm an account manager with the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. I'm out of Thunder Bay, the Thunder Bay office. Uh, first, a very belated congratulations to um, elections and your success. Uh, this is the first time I've spoken to Dryden Council, uh, this council. And uh, what I usually try and do is go around after elections and try to give them a council orientation process. Uh, just tell them a little bit about what we do and what our processes are at MPAC and how we come up with valuations. I do look working forward, looking, sorry, I, do, I look forward to working with you all throughout 2023 and beyond. Whether you're newly elected or a seasoned official, please know that we're here to help. We have an entire municipal and stakeholder relations team who can answer any questions 
that you may have, uh, my contact information will be available at the end of the slideshow. Plus, there's a lot of people, staff in the Dryden office who actually have my, my contact information. That's good. Uh, at MPAC, we are Ontario's property experts. Our job is to assess and classify more than 5.5 million properties across Ontario with a combined value of over $3 trillion. In the past year, Ontario has grown by approximately 45,000 new residential homes. And in 2022, we added more than $37 billion to Ontario's assessment rules. Every municipality uses our assessments to make informed decisions about their community, including the distribution of property taxes. Ontario's property tax system and these assessments generate approximately $30 billion in tax revenue uh, annually. Next slide. There are four key players in Ontario's uh, property assessment and taxation system. All have a different uh, role and interest in the process. The provincial government, specifically the Ministry of Finance, is responsible for setting taxation, uh, assessment taxation and legislation as well as policies. They also determine the education property tax rate. Uh, there is also an independent body that adjudicates appeals of MPAC's assessed values, the Assessment Review Board. We call them the ARB. This also falls under the jurisdiction of Ontario and uh, the provincial government as, uh, through Tribunals Ontario. MPAC is an independent, not-for-profit corporation funded by all Ontario municipalities. Our role is to accurately assess and classify all properties in Ontario. We do this in compliance with the Assessment Act and regulations set by the Government of Ontario. We are accountable to the province, municipalities, and property uh, taxpayers of Ontario through a board of directors that is comprised of uh, provincial, municipal, and taxpayer representatives appointed by the Minister of Finance. Uh, separately, uh, on a sort of on a side note, uh, on MPAC, we also have the Office of the uh, Quality Service Commissioner. They report to the MPAC board, directly to the board, so they're not under the CAO. They complete reviews, provide recommendations and technical advice um, to the Quality Assurance Committee and on quality measures related to assessment and classification. Municipalities, on this one, uh, determine their budget requirements, set tax rates, collect property taxes, and pay for municipal services such as police, fire, roads, recreation, water, among many others. I don't have to tell you your role. Um, municipalities use MPAC's assessments to establish tax rates and distribute uh, tax requirements to ratepayers. And finally, the property owners uh, pay property tax bills and help set market value through ongoing purchases and sales of property. Next. As you can imagine, as you can imagine uh, maintaining uh, Ontario's property database is very important. Property data continuously is updated so that municipal records are accurate when our municipal stakeholders are making important tax decisions. Uh, municipal, sorry, maintaining uh, Ontario's property database includes inspecting and assessing new construction, additions and renovations, responding to property owner inquiries and working to help them understand their assessments. We support municipalities through an ongoing uh, uh, support process. Uh, we offer Municipal Connect. It's our, our, our service, uh, through a service level agreement, of course, through a data sharing plat platform. It's an application portal that municipal staff use to access um, the primary source of assessment related information, other than the actual role. And the role is actually part of that. Uh, we work collaboratively on projects as well, like digital permitting. Uh, we do this through a municipal liaison group, which uh, some municipalities are part of. We meet regularly, I think monthly. Uh, we have important statutory duties as well as handling requests for reconsideration and appeals and maintaining people data by tracking school support for 5.5 million properties. Uh, the reassessment that was scheduled uh, to occur in 2020 was postponed by the province to provide stability and certainty uh, to Ontarians and enable municipalities to focus on responding to the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, property assessments continue to be based on a legislative valuation date of January 1st, 2016. This should not have uh, a negative 
financial impact, impact on municipalities. As impact continues to maintain an update assessment role to reflect changes such as new construction, improvements to property. Um, sorry, I will discuss this further near the end of the presentation as well. Uh, for new buildings or structures, impact determines a value of January 1st, 2016 to ensure equity when comparing to existing properties. Next slide. Ontario's property tax system is based on everyone paying their portion of what it costs to deliver the uh, community services. To do this, all properties are assigned a value at a common valuation date, like I said in the previous slide, of January 1st, 2016. Uh, this principle is called Current Value Assessment, or CVA. Uh, this is the price a property might uh, reasonably, reasonably be expected to sell for if sold by a willing buyer to a willing seller. Uh, after appropriate time and exposure on an open market. This has been talked about the assessment cycle for a second. Uh, this slide explains what happens when there is an assessment update called. It, it shows a link between the chosen valuation date, the mailing of assessment notices, uh, and also the phase in, uh, which is the bringing of new assessed value of a property into effect over a period of time. In this, in this assessment cycle, it's four years. The phase-in program was introduced by the province to provide additional level of uh, property tax stability and predictability. When properties experience a market increase in assessed value, it's spread out over the course of the cycle uh, and increase. So it's phased over, this one is phased over four years. Assessment decreases are applied in year one of the cycle. Talk about uh, how we value properties now. Uh, when we're looking at the valuation of a residential home, although our analysis tool considers over 200 factors, the above five make up approximately 85% of a typical home's value. They include location, lot dimensions, exterior square footage, quality of construction of a home, and the age of the property, uh, which gets adjusted for any renovations or additions that happens or that have occurred. We call this effective age. Uh, in Ontario, there are three industry-wide standardized approaches to evaluating properties. The first of these approaches uh, is the direct comparison approach. This is the most popular one. And it is the valuation approach that is used primarily for residential properties, condos, and vacant land. With this approach, we analyze recent sales of comparable properties that were sold for a similar or identical use to provide an indication of value. It is also important that only valid open market transactions are used in this analysis. Next. The income approach is used for industrial malls, large medical and dental buildings, office buildings, shopping centers, and large sports stadiums. Uh, in the in income producing properties, the ability to earn revenue is directly tied to its current value. Uh, to value these properties, we need to determine how much revenue it could generate as well as the sale price. So to clarify, this is not the revenue being generated by the occupant, but rather the rent the occupant is paying to the landlord that we use to value properties in the income approach. Uh, this method requires a detailed analysis of the income and expenses, uh, both for a property being valued and other similar properties. To determine how much income a property could expect to generate if sold on the open market. And at MPAC, we send out what we call a peer report. And it stands for a property income expense report where we collect data from property owners about um, in, uh, rent uh, and income and expense. Uh, those two factors create what we call the capitalization rate or the cap rate of the property's assessed value. Lastly, we have the cost approach and is typically used for general purpose industrial properties, uh, small retail, gravel pits, warehousing, just name a few. And we have a giant example right across the river uh, with the mill. This approach is used when a property type is unique and rarely sold on the open market, as we cannot rely on either uh, direct comparison or the income approaches to determine its current value due to lack of data. The cost approach is a three-step process. First, we calculate the cost of replacing building structures and other accessible fixtures on the land. Then we apply a deduction or reduction 
for depreciation on all structures due to age, as well as any function or, or economic adjustment. If there are conditions impacting uh, the value of the property, we call this economic obsolescence or functional obsolescence. Finally, we determine the value of the land and add it to the building calculations to produce an overall valuation. So what draws our attention to a property? Uh, it is typically one of the following things, a market sale, a request from a municipality or property owner, uh, building permit activity, or an RFR, a request for consideration, or an appeal. MPAC's role is to take building permits and plans and turn them into assessment. Our municipal stakeholders rely on MPAC assessments to levy property tax. The sooner MPAC can deliver property assessments, the sooner our taxing authorities, which includes municipalities, uh, uh, um, local roads and service areas as well, um, uh, the sooner they uh, realize, uh, or sorry, the sooner they can realize new assessment revenue. You know, it's all it's always better as uh, we can do this quickly, working with uh, you know the building department and the chief building official to get those building permits in as soon as possible. Every year, MPAC actually processes about 300,000 building per, uh, permits for new developments and renovations. We are currently the uh, sorry, we're currently the only organization with a data set of all building permits in Ontario. So our understanding of this gives us um, a unique perspective on ways to modernize its collection and exchange uh, to support our municipal partners. Thank you. Uh, after we process, <clears throat> uh, after we assess a property or change in assessment, we mail the property owner a property assessment notice. Now, sometimes property owners don't agree with the assessed value. Uh, the property owner might contact municipality, might, con might express this concern to uh, councillors as well. Um, what, what the property owner should be asking themselves is uh, number one, uh, should, you know, could their property, what could their property have sold for on January 1st, 2016? Uh, number two, have they visited aboutmyproperty.ca uh, to review the information MPAC has on file regarding their property to ensure it's all correct? Uh, and also, have they used about my property to conduct a comparable research on, on assessment values in their areas? If a property owner still disagrees with their assessment, they have the option to file a request for consideration, which we'll review, we review free of charge. If there is also an ability to file an appeal with the assessment review. Uh, the fastest way to start a review is by filing an RFR on the aboutmyproperty.ca website. We can also get to that through uh, impact.ca as well. So I want to spend a moment to address the relationship between property taxes and assessment. Uh, assessments distribute taxes. They do not determine taxes paid. Uh, when a province-wide assessment update occurs, the most important factor is not how much the assessed value of a property has changed, uh, but rather how the assessed value has changed relative to the average change in the class in that community. So this concept is explained in, uh, in a recent toolkit that was shared with municipalities. Very next slide. So anticipation of the next province-wide assessment, we have implemented a strategy to address misconceptions about the relationship between assessed value and taxation, including resources for municipalities that will ensure when an announcement is made, we're ready to support you and the property owners. Uh, the, digital tool, uh, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> the digital toolkit is available at impact.ca. Uh, it can help municipalities, including elected officials, of course, mitigate infra, uh, misinformation and provide support and resources to educate and inform property owners. In the digital toolkit, you'll find a new video, uh, how to, oh, sorry, how your property taxes are calculated and it's based on the assessed value of your home. Um, so we can't really play it here. Sorry about that, but, um, there will be, hopefully the clerk will be able to distribute this presentation and you can go to the video from there. We do have a YouTube webpage as well, and you can find it on impact.ca, the link to that. Sorry. There we go. Perfect. Uh, monitoring the market and assessing newly built and renovated properties are things we do every day to keep our property data current. We also periodically 
update every single property <clears throat> assessment in Ontario based on the same legislated valuation date, which I talked about already. We call this an assessment update or a reassessment. The valuation date for the most reassessment update, which took place in 2017, which was delivered on January 1st, 2017. That valuation date is January 1st, 2016. It reflects data that was collected from 2012 to 2015. Uh, this is when we determine what every single property in Ontario would have reasonably sold for in its current state and condition at a particular point in time. So a regular revaluation of these properties ensures that assessments stay up to date and similar properties of similar value in the same municipality pay similar property taxes. Provincial legislation determines when AMPAC conducts a province-wide reassessment and, and sets the valuation date for each update cycle. Once the province announces the next reassessment date, we will let you know as soon as possible. All right, just a, a slide I added uh, at the end here, uh, some important statistics regarding the total value of assessment added to the role in the last few years. So this is during the COVID year, so please keep that in mind as well, uh, during shutdowns. And uh, there were a lot of challenges during those years as well uh, with staffing. Uh, so in 2020, we collected, uh, sorry, we added 2.9 million to the role. In 2021, 3.7 million. In 2022, 4 million. Um, and 2023, we have forecasted uh, 3 million currently, but as we get more information from the building department or the chief building official and permits roll in, we can add more to that number as well and hopefully get boots on the ground and finalize those numbers. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, just want to make sure we stay connected. You can actually subscribe for the In Touch uh, e, uh, municipal e-newsletter through impact.ca. Uh, we also have a library of digital resources available. And the next slide is just my contact information, also my manager's contact information on, on there. Uh, I believe I will open it to questions now. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Drogo. I'll ask council members if you have any questions. Councilor Price. Yes, uh, thank you, Thudu Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephen, for the um, feedback going on, uh, for your um, presentation. Um, is it all right if I just ask all of my questions and you can just answer them all and then I won't? Okay. Uh, so you had noted that the, the assessed rates are still based on the 2016 rates. Can you uh, give us any indication when that is going to change to a more current rate? My question number one. Um, question number two is um, the difference between the assessed value and uh, let's say like I'm a new owner. So in town and um, the appraised value. So we just had a house appraised um, and they're, they're quite different. One yeah, is yes. right. Yeah. Um, well, impact considered an appraised value, a good argument for a lower assessed rate. My la and my last question is, um, the assessed rate for, is it 2021 or 2022? I can't remember. Um, seems a little low. We were uh, discussing between councillors. There was a huge build in Dryden and how we come to that amount. The, with the the seniors complex, I can't remember what year that was, but it it all of these rates seem quite low for any of these, except for 2023 because we're only halfway through the year. Um, how that reflects when we add that huge build uh, down at the end of Van Orn. Thank you. Okay, um, number one, uh, the assessment valuation, val uh, sorry, the reassessment and evaluation date are set by the province of Ontario, uh, particularly the Ministry of Finance. We have not been given um, a date yet. I have that, I, I, I've been asking uh, the CAO even, uh, and she assures me that uh, the Ministry of Finance has not given any indication of when, number one, 
what the valuation date is going to be. Number two, when the assessment update will occur. And number three, what data is set, as in what years of sales will be included in that uh, in the reassessment. So I can't answer that. That, your, that was your first question. Your second question uh, is assessment versus appraisal. And, and it goes back to when the assessment update is going to occur. So if um, during my presentation, I mentioned that we collected data uh, for the 2016 valuation date. So basically we collected that data be, from the la between the last assessment update and the 2016 or 2017 assessment update. And those are the years that we collected data for to come up with that 2016 valuation date, uh, all the values for that 2016 valuation date. So if you're looking at a valuation right now, an appraisal right now, it's going to be very different because you have to consider what was your house going to sell for on January 1st, 2016. And we simply can't go against the legislation and and update those valuations yet. So, and um, sorry, your last one again. I thought. These new mics. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. Uh, totally fine. Um, in the last graph, you've got the 2020 to 2023. We can understand the 2023 oh, because yes. we're after. I got group. that. Yeah. So, um, so that those numbers i understand so first of all the data collected is based on building permit activity so we actually get out and collect data based on and assess and add it to the role as we as soon as we can as soon as we can when we get that building permit data from the building uh, building department here in Dryden. so uh, i'm uh, i would say that we are currently as up to date as we possibly can be on some of those. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure why there wasn't as much building permit activity, but that I don't think it reflects on uh, impacts ability to collect that data. Uh, as far as um, new construction of that multi-residential property, um, Again, we're going back um, to the 2016 values. And new construction, uh, there was a new construction class on that, which brought that actual property uh, down. So I, know, I, I actually know which one you're talking about. So I can't speak to a lot of individual properties right now. It wouldn't be fair, but I believe that's what happened with that one. It fell under a different tax class. And there was a legislative interpretive uh, analysis done on it. Okay, hey, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I don't see any. Thank you very much uh, for your presentations. Uh, very informational. It'll be, it's good for council as well as the public to understand the process because once the new assessments do come out and uh, and uh, there will be, be quite a change in the market value since 2016. Well, I, I will be back when we announce that, and uh, hopefully I'll have some more information for you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. We have no uh, public notices this evening. We have no committee and board reports from council this evening. Uh, we're now at consent agenda part one general. I will ask the clerk to conduct this section of the agenda, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll review the two items in consent agenda part one general. And as always, when I'm done, I'll ask if there are items members of council would like to speak to or sever for a separate vote. The items uh, that we have today are under adopt and receive minutes, and these are the minutes of the June 26 council meeting, which are to be adopted, as well we have the summary report of the NOMA board meeting held June 20th to be received. Any member of council wish to speak to or sever one or both? 
both of these items for a separate vote. Okay, hearing none, uh, ask Kirk for someone to move and second the motion. Move and second it, Councillor Price and Councillor Latham. Moved by Councillor Price, seconded by Councillor Latham, that Council hereby consider the following items of the Consent Agenda Part 1 General under the date of July 10th, 2023, as read and adopted, 9A and B. All those in favour? Right, carried. Thank you. think I didn't have my mic on. So I'd like to call our Mrs. Pateman to present her report, please. Thank you through the chair. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm present this evening to present a staff report regarding the management letter for 2022 from our audit. Um, for those that may not know, each year, along with our audited financial statements, the city's auditor issues a management letter that makes recommendations to staff regarding safeguarding the city's assets, the ass accuracy of the records, and any procedural improvements that we can make. Um, in the current year, which is 2022 for reference, um, there were no management letter points related to the main audit, and there was only one related to um, information systems, which is now a separate piece of the audit that started in 2020 because there were so many changes um, concerning remote work and increased reliance on electronic systems. Uh, they've scoped that in now as part of the audit. Um, so the management letter point that we received for this year related to uh, the online banking platform and some processes related to dual authorizations. Uh, the first piece of that related to user access where it was not initially during that time of the audit um, implemented yet that dual authorization was in place for adding and removing users to the platform. A request to change this had been had been put in place, but the the um, the change hadn't actually been made at the time of the audit. Um, so subsequent to the audit, that is now in place and has already been addressed. Um, the second piece relates to dual authorizations relating to sending EFT files. Um, this, this issue really only relates to a select few individuals who have approver status. Um, so uh, we have controls in place and some internal segregation of duties that restrict um, within our departmental processes to mitigate that risk of any unauthorized transactions happening. Um, and as this issue lies within the BMO platform itself, we are going to have to work with BMO to implement the appropriate changes within their system to satisfy this, this change. Um, so that was our only management letter point this year and a copy of the, the actual letter from the auditors was attached for your reference as well. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can try to answer. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions from councillors? Okay, hearing none. Oh, oh, Mr. Nesbitt, go ahead. Thank you, through your worship. Uh, not, not a question, but just a comment. Uh, I just want to uh, thank Chelsea and, and Stephen and the rest of the finance uh, department for their their efforts on the audit to uh, to achieve a, a almost clean management letter is is definitely an achievement. So they should be congratulated on on that. And uh, again, I thank them uh, all for for their hard work. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, well said, Mr. Nesbitt. Uh, it all, only comes to attention things that you know maybe need correction, not exact, not the uh, the excellent work that uh, that the finance department has done. Well done. Thank you.
Uh, I'd like to now call our Ms. Gillen to present her staff report, please. So good evening, Mayor and Council. So I'm back before you tonight with another site plan control application for your review and approval. Um, the report tonight is regarding site plan control for 99 Albert Street. The applicant is Community Living Dryden Sulekout. The applicant has submitted plans and reports, has signed the agreement attached to this report, and submitted their value of security at $43,000. The applicant is intending to develop 99 Albert Street to accommodate a two-story office building uh, to, make way, to make way for their employees and the continual expansion of client services that they provide to our community. The land was purchased by the applicant and subsequent demolition of the existing church was completed last fall. Although the applicant is currently seeking the approval of site plan control, I wanted to make council aware that a conditional foundation site preparation and servicing permit has already been issued. A conditional permit is an option that I as a CBO have as the authority having jurisdiction under the Building Code Act. This conditional permit allows the applicant to start the site preparation uh, process in advance of approval of an agreement with the caveat that the applicant assumes all risks and costs associated with this advanced site work with no guarantees of approval of the application or issuance of a full building permit. In order to issue a conditional permit, it is required that a full review of the application and associated plans must take place. Comments, concerns, and any required changes thereto are communicated to the applicant and must be agreed upon by the applicant to the satisfaction of city staff. Full building permit plans must be in possession of the city and the security value associated to the site plan agreement must also be received. The above described requirements for this application have been completed, including any associated applica application and permit fee charges. I'm asking for your approval to move this forward um, as city staff have reviewed it and accepted the plans as presented. I'm open for any questions regarding this development you may have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Gillen. Any questions from council members this evening regarding the site control plan? Documentation was well well put together. Uh, is council in favor of uh, endorsing the, the control plan? Okay, I seen lots of that. Okay, you've got your answer. Council is supportive of moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to call on Mr. Belanger to present his two reports, please. There. Um, good evening, all. For you, uh, uh, before you this evening, I have a recommendation to proceed and award um, the cafeteria services uh, agreement to uh, 1969720 Ontario Inc. for a two year period for a monthly rate of $825 plus applicable taxes under the terms and conditions outlined in the attached uh, agreement that, that accompanied this report. Uh, furthermore, we'll ask that mayor and clerk uh, authorize this agreement upon approval. Bit of a background, um, 2018 City entered into a three-year agreement with the previous concessionaire. That agreement was extended twice, um, primarily due to uh, some of the unknown circumstances that we were experiencing as a result of COVID and the related shutdowns and openings that went along uh, through it. Uh, with those unknowns in place, we had worked out an arrangement at uh, basically a, a daily rate for hours of use during that time until we knew that programming uh, had stabilized and of course it since has. So um, with that, we were able to release a uh, request for proposals earlier this spring. Um, through that, we had a number of inquiries, but only two formal submissions. Submissions were very, very close uh, with price being essentially the only variable on there. Interviews were conducted with both respondents and upon completion of those interviews, um, we have come to the determination and come forward today with a recommendation to proceed uh, as indicated in today's report. Um, we asked that uh, the concessionaire be available 
available for operation from August 15th to May 15th. And when we say that, um, that is our ice install dates and our ice removal dates are um, a little bit flexible. Uh, and, and we are flexible to the requests of our users uh, if those dollars are there. So that's why you see that. And you'll note that we speak to uh, a little bit of a different hours once we reach into the September months and we get into our regular programming that carries through uh, the end of March. And that's to ensure that the concession services are available to all of our patrons when they visit the facility during our peak periods. Um, for a respondent, uh, again, uh, as included in the report, agrees to uh, operate the canteen based on those minimum hours in 9 to 5, September through March. Provides sufficient staff to properly run the canteen for all uh, minor sports programming, including special events and our junior A teams. Provide healthy food alternatives, variety in prices. Those were included in the uh, proposal packages. Um, provide the municipality with a number of pieces of documentation, including insurance and uh, safe food handling certificates and ensure that they follow our restrictions on prohibited food items that could include energy drinks such as monster which is not pro, uh, not permitted within the facility or at least not for sale same thing with the likes of sunflower seeds peanuts in the shell things that make it extremely difficult for us to uh, clean up the facility um, of note the concessionaire both of them, any of them, would have had a substantial investment to make as the city does not own any equipment uh, within the concession stand. All of that is owned by the concessionaire. We did acquire a triple sink, for, or a triple sink um, that was owned by the previous concessionaire upon evaluation of that and pricing for a new one, we were able to come to an agreement. So we actually do own the triple sink now, but none of the equipment is ours. It is a responsibility to be maintained by the concessionaire. We, of course, do handle the utilities. The agreement was attached uh, for your viewing. I'm not sure if anyone's had a thorough read of it or has any questions related to it, but uh, I'm here to answer any of those. Okay, I'll open the floor to the councillors. Are there any questions? Mr. I, have Roger? Yep. I have a couple. Council no. I'm gonna do like my friend Michelle did, and I've got two of them and I'll ask them right off the bat. First of all, uh, Mr. Belanger, what uh, I, I said that I see that they had to carry uh, liability insurance, correct? How much? Because th this is a situation where it's not in, there's something going on inside the building that may potentially cause a fire and destroy the whole place. They have to have sufficient liability coverage for that. And what what is that value? The minimum is uh, $2 million is what it is for the concessionaire right now. And that's keeping in mind our existing uh, infrastructure that's there with the sprinkler system running throughout the building. And we do maintain that. So, and uh, there is no um, vented deep fryer, as we would say. We do have, uh, we permit what are a deep fryer in a contained unit, uh, perfect fry machine. I believe you're familiar with them or you may be familiar with their uh, answer no. $2 million won't replace that, that that building. And the other question I had was, having had experience there during major tournaments and whatnot, the um, way that that concession was set up, there's no way that they could handle the volume there. Is there an ability for other vendors to set up on or near the place outside to support that because it's not about a vendor being financially viable in there that shouldn't be our business it should be the residents and the people that are using it having availability to services food things like that it's not about the vendor making money was that a specific caveat in the contract that no one else can be there There is caveat in the agreement that no one is permitted to set up on the actual facility grounds when they are paying rent and under agreement with the city of drive. And so essentially that no one could come in and essentially um, get onto that property and potentially take business away from someone who's paying rent to the corporation of the city of Dryden for that service. Now, the city of Dryden, of course, has, um, let's say, relaxed some of our food vending opportunities um, for 
to be able to go on to other properties you know, and, and be there in service events. So there is the opportunity for them to come around, but not set up on the building at the time when there is ice in the facility. Mr. Nesbitt? Uh, thank you, through your worship. Just a couple of comments to uh, Councillor Knowles' uh, questions. So the city uh, uh, carries property insurance, facility insurances um, on on the facility, the liability um, for uh, for uh, 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 user associations and uh, and the vendor that would be selling is is above and beyond that. It is liability insurance. It's not it's not property insurance. And just just to add to uh, to Mr. Belanger's comments around the um, around the policy that we have to protect. Um, you know the the right of the uh, of the leasee of that space. I think uh, Mr. Belanger summed it up very well. Uh, we have we have a business paying us rent um, to serve food to the patrons of the arena, and during those ice in periods, it's it's uh, in my opinion, it's it's uh, more than appropriate to offer that that protection to that leasee. Um, we normally don't. Uh, uh, charge fees, so to speak, outside of business licenses and stuff for for mobile food vendors to uh, to set up. Um, so there is definitely a competitive advantage to those for those mobile food vendors to come in and, and set up and compete against, you know, that vendor that is that is paying the city rent to, uh, you know, to to use that space within the facility. My comments and thanks. Uh, Councilor Tardif. Um, on the exclusivity of the vendor having the canteen, I was just wondering, you do allow and rent for other events. Uh, this, this is just only during ice in. Now the upper halls and that where people can rent for birthday parties, are they, does that bind you in any way where you're stuck to have, like they couldn't bring up, you know, food in or someone who's barbecuing for them or or if there's a band dance or any other event like that, I just it's not something that can come back to bite the town if an event puts on with a an evening vendor or something in there. The way that it is, if you were to rent the facility, if you were to have a birthday party, you are more than welcome to bring in cake, um, coffee, anything else, provided you're not selling it. You're there giving it to your guests. Then that's quite okay. And the same thing if you were hosting a special event up, say, in the complex hall. We haven't had that yet for the uh, arena side. We will have a new hall space very soon that'll be able to offer that. But uh, we haven't uh, the goal until we can reevaluate and then possibly re release once that space is done because there won't be kitchen facilities in that hall. We would operate under the same premise that if you were hosting an event and you brought food, no problem, and you're able to serve it to your guests, you know, who are there, you're just not in there selling at that time. And outside the uh, times when there is no ice, um, there's been several vendors who've set up on the grounds when the, the ice season is complete, you know, and we have no responsibility to that, uh, to that vendor at that time to ensure that they're there. Now, a lot of the vendors have reached out previously to the existing concessionaire, you know, are they able to offer that service? And then we have a space within the agreement that we can uh, allow them to be able to use as well, provided they maintain all of their insurance and they do pay that fee. Councilor Noll. If I could respond to uh, Mr. Nesbitt's comments. It's agreed that during regular hockey, that the concession is certainly able to handle that. During major events, though, for instance, when we had the Dudley Hewitt here, or or some of the uh, First Nations tournaments, they can't handle the volume. I, I disagree that they can. Um, that's a fact. They couldn't handle. It. So I don't know where you felt that they were able. To. Certainly, weren't. it's not about protecting the rights of that vendor, whoever it might be, who has it. It's about the people that are attending those venues that should be able to get access to food. That's what it's about. But I have to say I disagree with your evaluation. Uh, 
Uh, yes, to the chair. Um, uh, my question is, so this person, it's got it now. They do the most wonderful job. They're doing great. Is there an opportunity to extend it or do we have to go through another RFP every time? Sorry, I failed to mention that. There is room. It was a two-year agreement as present with the option to extend for a third. And uh, at that time, um, you know, we either, if we're pleased with the service that has been offered and we're happy the way things are going and they are willing, um, yeah, then we would move forward. But I would still come to you with a recommendation. Likewise, if they were to release it or we wanted to take a different avenue and go back out to tender again, I would be back in front of you um, with that recommendation to actually release um, and, and go back out to the public. And, and that may be another opportunity, you know, at that time, if council still has an appetite to review, um, you know, some of the comments that uh, Mr. Noel has, or Councillor Noel, my apologies, then we could absolutely, um, you know, take a look at that and, and look at and see where the appetite is for some of them special events. Okay, any other further questions or comments? We're ready to move forward, uh, Officer Clerk, to ask for a mover or seconder. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. We're looking for somebody to move and second the motion for this bylaw. Councillor Latham, Councillor Price. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Latham, seconded by Councillor Price that bylaw 2023 36 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of a lease agreement between the Corporation of the City of Dryden and 1969720 Ontario Inc. for the operation of the concession located at the Dryden Arena for a period of two years, be read a first, second, and third time. Okay. Hey, all those in favor? Those opposed? Carried. Thank you. And second report from Mr. Blanche, please. And through the chair, thank you. Um, before you, uh, my second report, I have a request to amend bylaw 22 66, the fees and charges bylaw for 2023. Um, this one is relation to our uh, commemorative bench program that we released a couple of years ago. Um, this program was designed to operate at a break-even cost, no cost to the city. Um, well, yeah, no cost to the city, no profit earned by the city on it, but we do get uh, the benefit of having benches installed around the community and the community benefits by having that opportunity um, to have a uh, bench dedication in a site that uh, maybe a member of the family or the family uses and, and thought may be able to benefit from it. Um, so around, uh, I guess it would be August of last year, um, you know, as we do for many other things, we update our fees and charges by law. At the time I reached out to our preferred supplier for these benches and inquired about uh, any anticipated pricing um, increases. Although there was none at the time when we did go through and make our first order early in 2023, there actually was uh, an increase um, since the six months that uh, we, we had actually reached out to that group. So um, as a result, with that one, with the shipping, we actually lost a small amount of dollars. Um, when you look at the cost of a bench and the quality of the bench and the duration of it, not a huge loss, but uh, a loss nonetheless. So um, with that, uh, there's been an adjustment. I notified uh, our public works department who assists in the delivery of this program, particularly uh, the installation and, and some of the accounts. So uh, we made note of that. And again, today we've got a recommendation that we feel confident will carry us through the uh, end of 2023 and prior to the passing of the 2024 fees and charges by law. I will again get an update to ensure that uh, whatever fee that we're proposing uh, we feel will carry us through and if possible, if we can enter into an agreement with the supplier to be able to hold that rate so I don't have to visit you again um, halfway through a year like we have today. Any questions for council? Council no. This is a great idea. I, I can't believe I missed this. Are there benches set up somewhere now that 
and where are the names on them? I, I must have missed this somewhere. It's been a challenge to promote this program on where do you do it? Do you put it on that person's bench or do you put it where you, where you imagine a bench? But uh, we actually got two of them are shipped out. To, will be arriving today. I ordered four more for the dog park today. The two that are installed presently, there's one at Flat Rock up on top at Flat Rock. And if you were just to go across the street over to Princess Court, this is a little bit of a rare one. We don't normally put them on a private property, but seeing who the individual was, and we worked on an agreement for um, care and maintenance of that bench, not the city's responsibility, but there's actually one um, near the entrance of Prince and Co uh, Princess Court. There's two styles of benches. There's really three, two of the same bench, one with a very large plaque, one with a small plaque. The first style is designed for more recreation properties, as you would imagine, our parks, playgrounds, and things like that. And the second bench is uh, more for a green space or a passive space, the lines of Cooper Park, Flat Rock, or even Princess Court. So uh, we have been pumping this program quite a bit now on Facebook. Word is getting out. We're getting a lot of inquiries. And again, uh, we just ordered uh, another four more today. Good job. Good idea. Councillor Tardif. Through the chair, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I do have a question. Uh, you say it's at zero cost. Uh, how much you calculated that is that just the asset purchase or is that ongoing maintenance and repair to vandalism and if that's through public works budget or if it goes through your purchase that's just we acquired our vandal res resistance that come with a 10-year warranty we'll take care of minor vandalism that might not be under warranty but if the bench is ever damaged it's covered under a warranty on that so um yeah it's it's as good as we could really get it you know with that imagination and uh, we we looked at benches that um, would fit that would be robust enough um, yet still attractive and uh, in, in wouldn't fade or crack and you know wood and uh, the reason we only selected a couple was to ensure that we'd get a quality product and we could offer a level of consistency around the community what we don't want is various styles of benches and of quality Yes, a very good program. I think it will take off if once it's being promoted uh, for them to uh, provide benches for you know memory of their loved ones. Excellent. So I think we were looking to move this forward. Oh, I'm Was sorry. Councillor Noel, I said there was two benches in the community. There's actually four. There's two more at the Splash Park, which I forgot to mention, and that is more of that recreation facility style. So if you go to the Splash Park, there's a couple more there. My apologies to the families or for me for getting those. Okay, we're all council in favor of this cost recovery. Okay, carried. Thank you. We have no notices of motion this evening, so we have one motion this evening to ask the clerk to review. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Noel put forward a notice of motion at the June 12th Committee of the Whole meeting, which is being brought forward tonight as a motion. So I'll ask uh, the councillor to speak to it before asking for it to be moved and seconded. Thank you, Madam Clerk. This was a motion brought forward during the most recent and far too frequent death of an OPP officer in the line of duty as the OPP are now the providing police force for the city of Dryden. I felt it uh, germane that we look at uh, what our flag policy is and that it be uh, amended to reflect that whenever an OPP officer in this province dies in the line of duty, that uh, city owned properties that have flags be lowered to half mast. And that is uh, a motion for your consideration. Subject, any questions? Thank you, Councillor Noel. Um, any questions or comments from our councillors? No, oh, very good. So, need a mover and a seconder? Yes, please. Okay. You're going to move. Thank you. Thank you. 
Moved by Councilor Noel, seconded by Councilor Tardif that Council directs staff to amend the City of Dryden's flag policy by including that any OPP officer who dies in the line of duty will be recognized by having the flags at municipal buildings lower to half mast. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to the reports of municipal officers, and I'll ask our CEO, Mr. Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, to Your Worship. So on uh, July 1st, I had the pleasure of attending our uh, Canada Day celebrations down at uh, Cooper's Park, and uh, uh, the uh, the event uh, at the park was was attended by a large uh, large group of uh, folks. I was able to. Uh, watch uh, his worship get dunked multiple times in the uh, dunk tank, which uh, brought a lot of joy to my day, uh, I have to say. So thank you, your worship, for uh, for that. Uh, but I do want to thank, uh, you know, our staff uh, in particular. I want to thank uh, Nicole Cropland, Joel Allen, and Steve Blanger, and the rest of the community services staff for uh, organizing and uh, and attending, um, running the uh, the events at the park. I also want to uh, thank our uh, our fire department, all of our full time staff. Uh, we're we're in attendance uh, with uh, with equipment and uh, and also to uh, to help dunk the uh, the mayor repeatedly that day, um, along with a lot of our volunteer firefighters. So I, I really appreciate the uh, the effort that uh, that all the folks, all of our staff, uh, put forward to uh, to make that event uh, successful. And then, of course, you know our public works staff behind the scenes are are helping uh, set up for for the events, uh, you know, including the fireworks that night, and uh, then of course helping uh, you know clean up, take down, and uh, get everything back to normal. So, really do appreciate the effort that uh, that goes into these events and and all the work that our staff do, and in, in not only running the events on the particular day, but the organizing um, that uh, that goes into them. So, so thank you and uh, and great job, folks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll call on Stephen Lansdow roll for his report, please. Uh, nothing from me this evening, Your Worship. Call on Ms. Eiler. Yes, thanks. I don't have a lot to report since our last meeting two weeks ago, but uh, our office has been busy uh, with arranging interments at the cemetery, issuing lottery licenses, booking civil marriage services and issuing marriage licenses, as well as responding to requests for parade permits and temporary street closures. Okay, thank you. I'll call on Mr. Poole for his report, please. I have nothing to report this evening, Your Worship. And finally, Mr. Blanger. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say thank you to our CEO, Mr. Nesbitt, for the kind comments. And I would like to extend that thanks to uh, the community services staff um, you know, and the fire department. Everything went well, you know, especially, um, you know, you, you go down to those fireworks and it, and it was a little tense knowing where we are on that situation. But we've got a very capable crew and uh, we had experts in place and it was great to uh, see the firemen out in the field after and really doing a thorough check to ensure that uh, our properties and our, and our residents' properties were, were well and protected. So, yeah, a lot of work, and uh, I'm really glad to see it was well attended. Thank you for your participation, uh, <laughs> Mayor Harrison. Um, would also like to um, just send my appreciation to uh, our residents for their patience and understanding as we went through our uh, annual pool shutdown. Uh, we Annually, we go into a shutdown, but this was the first in a number of years where we actually drained the pool completely, gave it a real good scrub down. Um, we had uh, a drain to replace at the very bottom of the pool, um, actually in our mechanical room. And the only time you could replace this drain would be when it was completely drained. So um, everything went quite well. We did a lot of, a lot of painting, uh, deep clean, moved the needle with our pool slide. Um, replace the diving board and uh, some flooring into the gym and uh, a nice little refresher for the pool. And uh, again, I want to thank all of our residents and our, our members for their patience as we go through that. Um, compressor room updates are all but complete now. Uh, pressure tested our new or three new reciprocal compressors in the refrigeration plant. 
everything looks uh, great so far. We're just waiting on some insulation to be installed and we'll be ready to start up here in uh, very early August. One of the things about working in arena is summer short, and, uh, but we're almost there already when we look at these clocks. So, um, and again, uh, if you have a chance to take a look, uh, check out some baseball. 21st to the 23rd of July, we're hosting the um, First Nations Memorial Classic. This is a tournament that we had hoped to attract for a number of years. Um, it was previously held up in Sioux Lookout. It'll now be held in Dryden for the first time this year. Uh, at least 26 teams, possibly as many as 24 taking part in that tournament. And uh, yeah, we're welcoming our visitors and uh, should be some great baseball to go along with it. I think that's all I have for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. As far as my remarks, I guess, you know, I was in July 1st and I did just want to thank all the businesses and volunteers and activity providers that did come up. It was really well attended. Uh, definitely a lot of kids at the event there and a lot of good future baseball stars that were able to hit the target and dunk a lot of people, including the firefighters, including myself. Uh, all in the good cause of raising money for the food bank. Uh, but yeah, I do, like uh, Mr. Nesbitt uh, pointed out, do want to thank the uh, our community services staff uh, did an excellent job organizing and running the event and and as well as the firefighters for getting dunked and setting up the dunk tank and, and doing the fundraiser. There was a lot of city staff there uh, making this event happen as well. Again, the fine works is nice to see that we were able to get that off. I know with concern around uh, the fire situation, but I think, uh, it was permitted. Uh, we did have significant rain and the location was really what made the difference. It was a good spot, uh, very risk-free. So it was a great day and um, so many people were able to participate on July 1st. I'll ask uh, councillors for any comments. Before I'll start with uh, Mr. Councillor McKinnon online there. Councillor McKinnon. I have nothing, Your Worship. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tardiff. Councillor Price. Uh, just a couple of things. So um, the BEA nominations for the Chamber of Commerce are still open. I believe it's until the um, 13th. And uh, if you want to nominate someone, you can go to the Chamber website. Um, Days of Summer just started on Thursday and it was very well received. Uh, I want to thank um, the staff at Public Works and at the administration office once again um, because I forgot to apply for the street closure and they were quick to get me going on that. So I want to thank both Allison and Lynn for uh, getting that done for me. And once again, Trevor at Public Works has been a dream to work with and um, helping us get things started and uh, um if anyone is interested in participating in the days of summer downtown, uh, no fee to participate. Just kind of give us a call and um, you can uh, just set up a table and a couple of chairs and um, hang out for from three till six on Thursdays. Um, other than that, uh, there's um, it's been quite busy. I was just filling out my calendar again. And this week, um, I guess on the 13th, no, on the 12th. We have the meeting for uh, with KDSB for the shelter. Once again, if any businesses are interested in attending that one, um, just give reach out to me and um, I will help you uh, get an invite on that one. Thank you. Councilor Noel. Uh, thank you, Worship. A few things. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, our clerk, Ms. Eiler, various local people here and businesses, including the Native Friendship Centre for the warm welcome my family member received um, at a tour of the city facilities and of the Friendship Centre. And uh, he loved our little town and uh, he's going to come back again. Uh, far to report, we have potentially a new member of the public coming on the working circle. I'm pretty uh, excited about that with the Friendship Centre. And one other thing is that on the 10th of August this year, the Dairy Queen will be hosting Blizzard, Blizzard Day in support of um, we have a Miracle Network for sick children. And the owners are looking for some counselors 
who's willing to come and spend an hour or two that day building blizzards. And there should be some local media there. So I hope if you can't come and help, that you'll at least come and uh, attend. And that's my uh, announcements. Thank you, um, Councillor Latham. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I have one thing. It's uh, This is an experiment with the museum. They're going to go for new hours from July to August 2023. The museum will be working Tuesday to Thursday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Friday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. The museum will open to the public each day at, after 10. And this will allow the staff uh, to run errands and do other things at the museum. And then they take a lunch break from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. And a reminder, this is just an experiment for this year. We're hoping that it uh, works out and, and maybe we'll have discussions about doing it further. And there's gonna be a survey um, come out that I think there's gonna be a survey right at the museum for people that come in the evenings. And this is to get the public out to look at the events that they have at the museum and and see if we can enhance the people who are going through it. Okay, thank you very much. So we're looking for the confirmatory bylaw. I'll ask the clerk to ask for someone to move and second the motion. Councillor Noel, Councillor Price, thank you. Moved by Councillor Noel, seconded by Councillor Price, that bylaw 2023-37 being the bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council be read a first, second, and third time. All those in favor? Good carried. Or into adjournment. Can you uh, ask the clerk to ask for a mover and a seconder? Certainly. Move and a seconder to adjourn, please. Councillor Tardif, Councillor Price, thanks. Move by Councillor Tardif, seconded by Councillor Price, that this meeting be declared adjourned. All those in favor? Harry, thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Thanks for watching NWO Voices. Please send us an email at nwovoices.ca if you have any topics for us to cover or comments.